Hello again. This is podcast number 17 and it concerns the mouth and the oropharynx. Let's start by looking at the mouth itself. The mouth extends from the lips back to the palatoglossal fold which is sometimes called the anterior pillar of the fauces. It includes the vestibule which is between the teeth and gums and the cheek. We normally regard that as being emptied by the muscle buccinator, perhaps assisted by the tongue. The roof of the mouth is the hard palate and the floor is the tongue. The mouth itself functions for eating, for talking and of course it's an extra passageway for the airway. Its sensations include normal touch and temperature but also include taste, the tongue and the lips being particularly sensitive. The mucous membrane is stratified squamous and the nerve supply arises primarily from the mandibular branch of trigeminal and the maxillary branch. Into the mouth empties the salivary glands in the form of the parotid, the submandibular and, and sublingual. If we now look specifically at the hard palate we can see that there is a mucoperiosteum, which is both mucosa and periosteum, very firmly adherent to the inferior surface of the palatine process of the maxilla and of the palatine bones themselves. From the posterior edge of the hard palate extends the soft palate, with the tensor palati into the edge of it, laterally, and the levator palati coming down to the superior surface and being able to lift it up. Towards the posterior edge there are the, both the greater and the lesser palatine foramina through which come the same named nerves from the pterygopalatine fossa. These two particular nerves have a, a fair number of fibers within them. As they carry not only a general sensation but also taste a little bit of sympathetic, parasympathetic from the pterygopalatine ganglion for secretomotor to the mucous cells and general sensation from the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. These same nerves extend into the soft palate as well and the soft palate itself consists of an aponeurosis, it has the tensor palati into its side, it has the levator palati acting on its superior surface and from the edge arise both the palatoglossus and the palatopharyngeus. There are a number of small muscles which work the uvula and it is covered with mucosa which has both mucus and serous glands within it. In addition there are a few taste buds also in the soft palate. Now on each side of the tongue there are the sublingual glands. These are mucus producing glands that lie between the mylohyoid and the genioglossus. Each has about 15 ducts, some open separately and others secrete into the submandibular duct. The secretomotor fibers for these glands arise in the corda tympani and are carried there by the lingual nerve which of course also produces general sensation to that part of the mouth. The arterial supply again is the lingual artery and branches of the submental artery. We need also to mention the submandibular gland at this time because its duct drains into the mouth. This salivary gland is both mixed mucus and serous. It has a large superficial part and a much smaller deep part and they join behind the posterior edge of the mylohyoid. Its duct is about 5 centimeters long. At first it's between the mylohyoid and the hyoglossus and then it lies subsequently between the sublingual gland and the geniohyoid. It opens into the floor of the mouth alongside the frenulum. In total it produces some 70 percent of all the saliva. As with the sublingual gland it has its secretomotor supply from the corda tympani carried by the lingual nerve. The parotid gland has rather more complex relationships but essentially it wraps round the posterior edge of the ramus of the mandible. It produces much more serous secretions. It's perhaps worth noting that it is surrounded by a fairly thick 
layer of investing fascia. This means that it is not particularly distensible and when there is inflammation within the parotid gland it can produce very considerable pain. Behind it is the sternocleidomastoid and the mastoid process. Above it is the external acoustic meatus and the temporomandibular joint. Anterior to it is the angle of the mandible, the medial pterygoid plate, the masseter and the stylomandibular ligament. Within the gland itself are the branches of the facial nerve, the retromandibular vein, the external carotid artery and lymph nodes. The auriculotemporal nerve passes very nearby it and drops off the parasympathetic fibers that it is picked up from the otic ganglion. Medially or deep to the gland there is the mastoid process, the sternomastoid, the posterior belly of the digastric, the styloid process, the stylohyoid ligament and the muscle, and the styloglossus, stylopharyngeus and the temporomandibular joint. Its duct passes over the lateral surface of masseter and then pierces buccinator to enter the mouth at the level of the second upper molar tooth. A description of the teeth is probably beyond the scope of this podcast. But just simply to say that there is a set of deciduous teeth numbering 20 and these appear between the ages of 6 months and 24 months whereas the adult permanent teeth is a set of 32 teeth that appear between the 6th year and the 24th year. They sit in special alveolar bone which allows a certain amount of movement. A point worth knowing is that most of the lower teeth can be anaesthetized by simply blocking the inferior alveolar nerve whereas in the upper teeth more localized local anaesthetic is needed above each tooth as the the teeth themselves are supplied by the superior alveolar nerves. Now let's turn to the tongue. It's classically and usefully divided into an anterior two-thirds and a one-third posterior. This has important implications from both a developmental point of view and a functional point of view. When we consider the pharyngeal arches we see that the anterior two-thirds has largely arisen from the first arch. The nerve representation from this first arch is the mandibular division of the trigeminal in the form of the lingual nerve. The posterior one-third arises from the third arch and this in turn is represented by its nerve supply of the glossopharyngeal. Indeed the only evidence that the second arch has taken part in the development is the appearance of the corda tympani, a branch of the seventh nerve. The corda tympani carries the taste from the anterior two-thirds but we've seen already that it also brings in the parasympathetic for the secretor motor fibers for the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. The specific movements of the tongue are controlled by a number of extrinsic muscles but first of all one needs to know that there are also intrinsic muscles. These intrinsic muscles are not attached to the bone and they're divided up into longitudinal transverse and vertical fibers. They're able to change the shape of the tongue and for instance protrude it out of the mouth. They're all supplied by the hypoglossal nerve. Then there is hyoglossus which comes up from the hyoid bone into the sides of the tongue. This muscle will pull the tongue downwards 